listening and problem solving were the two things I wrote down, right? And I think that's kind of what drove me to the UX because I like puzzles and I like solving problems. And I think entrepreneurs are doing the same thing. They're trying to solve a problem that they've solved themselves. Do UX designers make good entrepreneurs? You probably already know my answer to that, but let's talk about it anyway. Do you want to decommoditize your products and services? Do you want to become a destination brand, increase your revenue, and have more control over your pricing? Well, you're in the right place. Each week, we'll talk about how to create great customer experiences and how to orient your company to enable them. I'm your host, Devin Smith, and this is the Experience Leader Podcast. Welcome back to the show, folks. Today, we're talking about whether or not UX designers make good entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm a UX designer. I'm an entrepreneur. And I don't know if I'm a good one, but I do think that UX design wires you for being able to detect problems, to be hyper aware of things that cause people friction uh, in their lives and what they're trying to do. And I think that those are critical things to being a, a good entrepreneur. You first have to find a problem to solve in order to capture value for solving that problem. But I'm not just going to sit here and talk about it myself. I brought on my longtime colleague and former coworker, Joe Raposa, to chat uh, uh, with me about this. And uh, he has been an entrepreneur in the past. He's, he's owned multiple businesses. He and I used to work together at uh, a large bank uh, in their digital customer experience department. And he's now senior manager of UX design at Charles Schwab. So now, without any further ado, let's get into it. All right, folks, we are here with Joe Raposa, uh, and he and I are talking today about what makes a UX design, a UX designer, uh, potentially a great entrepreneur. But first, Joe, it's been a long time, man. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Devin. Thanks. Thanks it's for having good. me here. Yeah, it's good to have you here. Uh, uh, so for, uh, for the folks out in the audience uh, Joe and I used to work together at uh, Wells Fargo. We were both in uh, a digital uh, customer experience group. And uh, uh, Joe, what what are you doing now? What are you doing these days? Yeah, so I left Wells Fargo a little over a year ago. So I'm working for Charles Schwab uh, in the Bay Area. And I live in Berkeley. And we have an office in San Francisco. And I've got a team on the UX side. We're the digital. Um, and I run, uh, basically have a team of, content strategist, which is a little different than what I was doing at Wells Fargo. At uh, Wells Fargo, I had a mixture, you know, designer, like product designers, uh, visual designers, interaction designers, and and content strategists. Oh, wow. Wow. That must be a big change. So, so like, how, how does that feel to you? What's that like? It, it feels pretty good. It's a little more focused. Um, you know, I've always, as a designer, I've always had an, an eye towards content. And um, my wife, Laura Lynn, is actually a content uh, strategy manager, or content design manager, they call it now, at, at PayPal. Oh, cool. So, Very cool. Yeah. So we, we talk after work about, you know, things about work. <laughs> that's awesome. That is awesome. That, uh, that, that's cool to be, be in, the same, in the same industry, in the same sort of like skill set area and, and being able to to talk about that. That's, that's pretty neat. Uh, do you guys ever have arguments about, uh, uh, content strategy principles? <laughs> Not really on the principles. Um, but you know, we talk a little bit about, you know, people at our work and, you know, the good, the bad. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all, it's, it's all fun to talk about. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so, so you and I got to talking. um, uh, and I, you know, I've seen some of your 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 posts on on LinkedIn, and and we got it talking about the idea of of uh, UX designers uh, uh, and and you know entrepreneurship. What you know, what yeah. might make? I think you you did a post about what uh, uh, might make a, a UX designer uh, uh, a good entrepreneur because it, it's it's rare, right? Like you don't see you don't see a lot of CEOs who who are designers. I mean, famously. Um, right. uh, the, uh, uh, CEO of, of Airbnb is a designer, which is, which is pretty cool. 
um, and uh, is another business that 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 I've uh, recently come across. Uh, you know, the CEO, the founder of that uh, company, is a designer, and they're doing well. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm I'm curious to know, uh, you know, what what's your opinion? Do, do, do UX designers make good entrepreneurs? I'd say the short answer is yes. Most of them will will make great entrepreneurs. Um, and you know, as you know, when you work when you work for a large cor- corporation like Wells Fargo or or Schwab, you, you wear many hats, right? So depending on the makeup of the team, you could do a little bit of research. You could do you know a lot of you know Figma. You could be in Figma. You could be doing graphic design and inter- information architecture. Um, but of course, if you're a freelancer, you you always have to do that stuff, right? And I mean, you got your own business now, so. You know, you gotta you gotta wear all the hats. Um, you know, when you're renting a space, you even gotta clean the bathroom, right? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> that's how it works. Um, so it it takes a lot to to be an entrepreneur, obviously, right? And I, I've actually had my own business in the past. I've owned a co- you know I've owned a publishing company. I've you know put out CDs. Um, I used to own a couple of game stores, one in San Francisco and one in Berkeley. And my whole family are, are entrepreneurs. I have an older brother who um, he owns his own lumber business. And I've got a sister in South Pasadena. And she and her husband have a, you know, a, a property management company. So it's, you know, I think entrepreneurship runs in our blood. Um, but I've always kind of just dabbled in it and then went, went, back, to, um, went back to the corporate structure. Wow. So, so, I mean, that's, that's fascinating. I never, I, I never knew that. That's really cool. Uh, uh, fun fact, you mentioned that you had, um, uh, you had like a sort of, uh, publishing business, you, you know, had, uh, you know, publishing CDs and stuff. I, so I got my start in design when I was a sophomore in high school designing album art for, uh, local nice. bands that my dad was, my dad is a, a music and audio engineer. And so they would rent studio time from him and uh, they, they, he would figure out that they didn't have anybody to do their CD manufacturing. So he started a small business out of the house and nice. we would actually, um, I had to, it, like, he bought this giant Epson printer um, that uh, would, that sat in my room uh, that could actually print on the top of, of CDs. And uh, wow. I, I would design, I would design the album covers and print out the, the inserts and uh, print on the CDs, and uh, he would do all the the mixing and the mastering, and and uh, we had like all these CD burners in his studio, um, and yeah. uh, we could burn about four CDs at a time, and we thought we were doing big things, man. <laughs> yeah, I remember, um, I remember printing everything separately, right? So the CDs would get printed in one place, and then the the booklets in another place. And then you get the jewel cases and then everything gets sent to you and you're just assembling it all. Right. So that's, that was a lot of work. (laughs) Yep. That was a, that was a family affair when it was time to actually assemble everything. Uh, We would have sort of an assembly line uh, either in dad's studio and which was the family room or, or uh, uh, the living room. And uh, you know, you'd have somebody stuffing. Yeah. You have somebody cutting somebody stuffing. Uh, and then uh, putting the um, uh, the shrink wrap, putting the plastic yeah. on the outside of them, and taking the uh, the special blow dryer and, and blowing yeah. on it so that it shrunk down <laughs> on the jewel case. So we we had the whole that's thing fun. going, man. That's that's how I got my start. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and um, it's interesting, you know. I I think that um, uh, I've I've considered this a few times. Like you know, the things that a, a, a UX designer has to be good at, um, uh, uh, things, the things that UX designer has to consider and, uh, you know, and, and just for the purposes of this conversation, you know, I know that, um, uh, people, uh, you know, like UX designers, and in, in my opinion, like the, the modern term for it, uh, uh, sometimes it gets called product designer. Right. So, right. um, I think those two roles are really, uh, interchangeable. Uh, a great UX designer is, uh, thinking about uh, uh, the business constraints, just like a product designer is, they're thinking about how it can be a great product, not just a great uh, interface, and and how it's actually solving the problem. Um, and those things cause you uh, to start to 
uh, think more about how to make something somebody actually wants to use. And I, I think that's a core part of, of being an entrepreneur, of, of making something or selling something um, that solves a problem for somebody. I think those things exactly. that, a, that a, a UX designer has to think about and has to be good at thinking about makes them a, a prime candidate to be a, to be a good entrepreneur. I completely agree. And, and I wrote that in my notes. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, listening and problem solving were the two things I wrote down. Right. Um, and I think that's kind of what drove me to the UX because I like puzzles and I like solving problems because there's always more than one way to do it. So you get to experiment, see what works, see what doesn't, <laughs> and then learn, learn from your mistakes. Right. Yeah. And I think yeah. entrepreneurs are doing the same thing. They're trying And they can either, you know, start a consultancy and, and start solving it one-on-one -on -one with other people, or they can create a book or, you know, a website that says, hey, this is free. Go figure it out, right? I already figured it out. They'll make my mistakes. And then you can sell other products to them, right? Courses or books, pamphlets, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Con yeah. Consulting, basically. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean... That's that's what I do. Uh, I do I do consulting. Um, you know, I, I will I will eventually, uh, uh, God willing, come out with with books and and courses. I already have ideas on those things. Um, but yeah, you know, you wind up falling in love with uh, with a problem, and and uh, you know, in in the startup world, it's one of the things that they say: fall in love with the problem, uh, yes. and and you'll you'll want to solve it, and it, and it will inherently make you. Um, very good at solving that problem because you're always trying to solve it better. It, it protects you, um, even protects you from disruption because you're always looking at a way to solve the problem better, which is, you know, disruption exactly. occurs when somebody's not solving the problem as well as somebody else and, and customers start moving. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. And it reminds me of, of Apple, right? So Apple was never the first to do anything. They were, they were a follower. But they said we're going to make it better, and they did. <laughs> right. Um, you know, I, I remember when I first started working at Wells Fargo. Um, someone was a really into Apple. He was a graphic designer there, and I think Apple's stock at the time was like eight dollars a share. They like they were in the tank, right? Uh, it was just after you know before Steve Jobs came back, um, and then I worked at Washington Mutual for a little while. And I, you know, I got into Apple pretty heavy. Um, in fact, the, one of the first books I published back in 94, I was on like a LC2, um, you know, Apple LC2 that we don't have anymore, obviously. Um, but that was like top of the line. And I used uh, all, all this page maker to put it together. And then Adobe ended up buying all this. Um, so, yeah, it's just, you can see the trend happening in Apple News what the future looks like. And then they start building it now. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, I, I remember, um, you know, like they'll, t they'll, they'll enter a market sometimes and do something that, um, either somebody else already tried to do, uh, or, so, you know, sometimes they do something, uh, and they do it in a way that nobody else has done it yet. Um, that I think one of the great examples is, uh, the iPhone, right? Like nobody had come up with, nobody had taken the step of coming up with a smartphone. Like they didn't invent the smartphone, right? They invent the smartphone, but nobody else had done it quite that way uh, to where, you know, they were like, we're not going to have any buttons on the front of it, except for the home button. That's the only button it had. You're going to have, yeah. a, you're going to have a software keyboard. Nobody had decided we're like, we're going to do a hundred percent software keyboard. And I remember a lot of people saying, Oh man, no, I, I could never just type on a screen. I got to have a physical keyboard, man. That yeah. I don't know what they're thinking and all that stuff. And of course the iPhone just went on to like dominate, uh, uh, in, in the U S and then, um, the iPad, I think is another, another example. Uh, that one, I, I do think it was, that one was a little more unique, uh, in that, nobody had made something in that form factor, at least that I can remember. Cause it was easy to know that like, you know, other people had made smartphones, right? Like, uh, you had, you had other people out there making smartphones and, um, uh, PDAs yeah. and, and stuff like that. You had the Blackberry, which was the, you know, that was the, 
you had a BlackBerry, you were, you were, you know, you were, you were oh, important, yeah. right? <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> if you wanted to let people know you were important, you, you, you pulled the BlackBerry out of the pocket and, and put it on the table at lunch. Right. Um, exactly. that was, the, that was the thing. But, but when the iPad came out, I remember that that was, it was, it was definitely different, um, uh, from a lot of the other form factors that have been presented. Uh, and I remember thinking to myself, uh, that is that like, you know, uh, that's going to save certain types of media, right? Like I could, I already saw that, uh, like magazine purchases, um, and, and things like that, uh, uh, uh print newspaper purchases were going down, were, were, were de- decreasing. And I thought to yeah. myself and, and, and things like comic books, um, that was actually one of the things I thought I saw the iPad and at the time I was yeah. really into, you know, uh, uh, you know, doing comic book art. And I said, that thing's going to save comics. And, uh, uh, yeah. you know, the comic publishers thought the same thing because they, they, uh, started, uh, putting comic books out, uh, for the iPad form factor and it, it worked really well it, and it didn't take them long at yeah. all. I agree. Yeah. I mean, I'm a big comic book fan. Um, it was mostly Marvel, but what made comic books so famous was the stories, right. And the art. And, and now you've got the big, you've got the big screen to, to tell those stories and, you know, technology is so incredible now that you can watch the Avengers and pay your 20 bucks and yeah. watch it on a big screen. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious to know, um, you know, in your, in your mind, what, uh, what about a, a UX designer, uh, that, that, you know, might be, might be a, a typical or, or, uh, uh, you know, kind of inherent trait that makes somebody a good UX designer that might hold them back from being a good entrepreneur. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I, I think what I've seen and I've, I've been, I've been this UX designer, right. Is that when you're younger, you're learning it, you get kind of cocky. And you, you grow this ego of like, well, I can do something that, that you can't, or um, I have a specialty. And then you get into this fixed mindset that you get trapped in. And that will hold you back because you don't listen as well. Um, and you tell your clients or your stakeholders that they're wrong and it doesn't create a good relationship. Right. And so that would be a bad trait for entrepreneurs, right? <laughs> Trying to sell something that nobody wants. Um, look, look what I built. It's great, but nobody buys it, right? That's, that's not going to work. So you got to check your ego at the door and you have to just be, you have to say yes. Um, and you just have to be willing to be wrong, right? And, and admit that you can be wrong. And then that will get you to the point where I need to learn this and I'm going to learn it. Right. So as an example, when I, I got into UX through coding, right. So when I was publishing in 94, soon after the mosaic browser came out, right. And I was already on the internet using, you know, you know, code like Unix, like checking email in Unix. So there was no graphics. Um, so I, I, when HTML one came out, I'm like, I gotta learn this. So I got a book or 20 bucks and, and, and it was just basically trial and error, right? And, and, and back then, the web was simple. It was just like a Microsoft Word doc, you know, in HTML. <laughs> <laughs> um, but soon after, I, you add graphics and you learn CSS. But I really wanted to be able to send a web form and get a response, right? And, and I, so I had to learn like CGI scripting. Um, and so it kind of just built up over time. and. Um, like I even had, you know, a couple years ago, I was coding, um, in Swift UI, you know, just for fun, just to learn it. And I learned a lot. And then I learned, like, if I really want to get deep into this, I have to just become an iOS developer. <laughs> and I don't think I wanted to do that. Um, cause it, the technology is changing fast. Um, and I mean, look at chat GPT, right? Everybody's talking about chat GPT. Um, and I I don't know. My initial response was, I don't need that. But then I figured, well, I have a curiosity, so let's figure out what this thing is. And it's, it's pretty cool. Um, and you can, you can use it in your day to day, right? 
of course you have to tweak it. It's not going to give you perfection, but it's not a human, but it still makes mistakes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) um, So take it with a grain of salt, but I think technology is, you really have to stay on top of technology. You can't, you can't have that closed mindset of, Hey, I don't want to, I don't want to look at it. Right. Yeah. I think that, um, uh, it's funny you mentioned, um, uh, chat GPT. Cause I, um, you know, my first, my first response, it was like, Oh wow, that's cool. Um, I, you know, like I, I had a decent amount of skepticism that it would, uh, be able to write, uh, in a way that was going to replace good human writing, um, yeah. which is largely played out to be true. You know, like you, you can look at, and it can write, um, it can write, uh, uh, things that uh, are, are out there, you know, it's, it's obviously gathering its data from what's out there and it can write things that sound typical and, and it can even have different tones of voice, et cetera. But um, I've found that, that the way that it writes, you're, it's going to be hard to get something that, that sounds differentiated um, uh, yeah. from it. And so, uh, you know, it's a great starting point though. I mean, and that's one of the things that I've, I think is fantastic about it. It's amazing that it, uh, it, you can use it to come up with ideas. Um, you can use it to kind of give you a, a a starting point to, to be able to write, to, to write something. Um, and that's, that's, uh, uh, but, but like it is going to revolutionize things and that there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of, you know, kind of run of the mill stuff out there. And if, if you're producing run of the mill stuff, chat GPT is going to replace you. I mean, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not going to be, it's not going to be a whole lot of room for that, uh, anymore. You know, nobody's going to be willing to pay a human to do that, um, uh, anymore. Yeah. And, and that, I think that chat GPT is going to make that a reality pretty quickly. I mean, obviously it's, it's not great at, you know, you said it makes mistakes, which it does. It's not great at, um, uh, uh like understanding, uh, nuanced facts, uh, or being able to accurately, yeah. uh, uh, you know, mention things that have happened in history. Um, it's best at generative things, but, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're just trying to create a blog post, you know, some, some run of the mill blog post, uh, and maybe go in and edit it a little bit afterwards. I mean, uh, yeah. humans that are making run of the mill blog posts are going to get replaced real soon. Yeah. It, and it's for, you know, an outline for your podcast, right? It gives right. you a great outline. Just give it a topic, a, it's a 30 minute podcast or something, and it, it'll spit out some ideas for you. That's right. Yeah. I, I, I haven't even tried that yet, but I've, I've been tempted, uh, uh, to, to do that just because, you know, you need a lot of content to have a, a an ongoing podcast. And, uh, yeah. I've seen other people use it to come up with ideas. Um, and I, I can appreciate that, right? Because any of us is being creative. Um, we're, we're just taking things that, that we've seen and combining them, uh, in a new way. And it's not to say that nobody ever, um, uh, produces anything, uh, new, right. But like, uh, generally what we're doing when we're being creative is, is taking, uh, what we've absorbed, um, and putting it together in a, in, in a way that it hasn't been put together, uh, before. Um, and, and I think that, I mean, chat GPT is basically doing that. It's sourcing, uh, a lot more content than, than, uh, uh can be sourced in, by a human and, in, in uh, a short amount of time and spitting out ideas there. So I think it's going to be hugely beneficial, uh, uh, for that. I think it's a great use for it. Yeah. I, I saw something about mid journey. I think it was on LinkedIn or Twitter, uh, and people were complaining that, you know, you know, AI generated art is stealing, right? And I'm like, well, it's not really because look at what Andy Warhol did. He just basically took, you know, this Campbell's soup cans and put a spin on it. But it's, even though it's derivative, it's different, right? Um, and even nature, like if I, if I go to the store and I pick out two lemons, they look exactly the same, but they're unique, right? I would, if I named them, I probably wouldn't be able to tell them apart. <laughs> But, it, it, you know, it's, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting concept having, you know, like if I were to take, you know, a pencil and a paper 
and look at someone's art and then draw it myself, that's not stealing. That's like my representation of what I see because it's going gonna, it's gonna to look different. Even if I trace it, it's going to be different. Um, so it's, it's interesting. I, I don't know where this is going to go, but um, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. I think that um, like I understand some of the arguments, like some arguments aren't good uh, uh, or, or well thought out, but some are. And I think probably the strongest argument for when somebody say like, hey, this is stealing is when um, the AI art generator is literally ingesting images and sort of bashing them. Uh, and, and you can see the artifacts of the artist's signature, or yeah. you can see the artifact of the Getty Images watermark uh, in there still. <laughs> and, those. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you definitely copied, you're like, you're taking copyrighted images and, yeah. and that is illegal. Um, That's stealing, yes. Yeah. And, and so, but like, we, you know, when you have, I've seen some stuff that AI, uh, AI uh, uh, art generators are doing that it is extremely difficult for me to understand how it could do that unless it was actually, you know, creating something. Uh, right. You know, I've seen it make some things that I'm like, that's, I've never seen anything that looks like that. Maybe it took an image and they, they you know, like it, it adjusted it some, uh, but what it's doing there, um, some of those, I'm like, that's, that's pretty dang, uh, uh, pretty dang original. I mean, I don't, I don't know that, uh, right. that a human artist could say they were doing uh, uh, much difference. If it's putting down brush strokes, man, like no, no qualms for me. If you're ingesting images that like you, you know, like you basically sucked out of Google images or whatever, you know, aggregator you're getting and there's watermarks and artist signatures in there. Yeah. Like I think they deserve oh, yeah. to go after you. Um, uh, and, and you've got it coming, but some of that other stuff, you know, the, the U S copyright, the U S PTO office uh, basically just said, Hey, if it's, if it's completely 100% generated by uh, AI, then it can't be copyrighted because it wasn't made by a human. I, I tend to agree with that, um, uh, especially because the way that that uh, that art is created is still too much, in my opinion, linked to um, ingesting images and, and just kind of bashing them together. Um, yeah. But I think that uh, it's going to enter a new territory. I was talking to a lawyer friend of mine that it's going, they're going to have to update the law uh, at some point, oh, yeah. because it's going to get advanced enough where it, I mean, it's putting down brush strokes, if you will. And once right. the machine is putting down brush strokes, uh, you know, it, yeah. Is it the prompter that, that, uh, uh, you know, gets the copyright? I think so. Um, as long as it wasn't ingesting copyrighted images to do that, you know, like, uh, uh, yeah. I, I think so. I, I think the, the prompter gets the copyright. Exactly. I, I, I fully support copyright. Um, you know, having put out other people's, you know, music, you have to ask for permission and make sure they get their royalties and stuff. But the interesting thing about the copyright disclaimer on like on a book, if you read it, it says cannot be stored in a retrieval system, which is actually your brain. Right. <laughs> so technically reading a book is illegal. Especially <laughs> Especially if you do a review on that book and you said, this is what I read. It's like, well, that's technically legal based on the copyright law. <laughs> so, and, and that's been around since what, like 1972 or something, or even before that. Um, so yeah, they, I don't, the, the, the lawmakers have a lot of work to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm catching up to do. I, I will say that right at this moment, I do not envy um, uh, copyright. Uh, uh, anybody who's who's going to have to engage in updating the copyright laws, I, I do not envy those people. Um, I do envy the consultants that will be hired to help them make the laws because <laughs> yeah. they will make a lot of money. <laughs> exactly, and I I actually thought about going back to school and and you know becoming like an IP lawyer and learning about copyright and and patents and stuff and trademarks, but um, no. Nah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, uh, that same lawyer friend, he shows me sometimes some of the um, the stuff that he has to write for cases. And yeah. I, I, I don't think I could do it, man. I'd, I'd probably just as well jump off a bridge before I had to write that much of something that's that's that boring to me. He yeah, loves it, man. Chat GPT. That's right. That's, we're going to get to the point where they're not even writing it. Chat GPT is writing it for him. Yeah. <laughs> making 250 dollars an hour that's right or more <laughs> oh man I, I i once i started learning a lot of the ins and outs of being a lawyer i was like i understand why you guys make that much money i mean if you're going to go through that much pain you deserve it 
yeah yeah oh my gosh uh you know kind of feel the same with the uh, realtors too because they have to do all the paperwork and file it and that's too boring for me. And manage manage the expectations of of buyers, the unrealistic expectations yeah. of buyers, and all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I definitely feel for the realtors for sure. Oh man. Right. Um, you know, kind of going going back to like you know what would make a, a you know what traits of a UX designer might hinder them from being a great entrepreneur. You know, you kind of touched on on your thoughts on that. I think from my mm-hmm. perspective. Um, uh, the things that I, I can talk about the things that have hindered me, um, uh, okay. you know, I can tend to, and I'm not saying every UX designer has this problem, but I know that I can tend to um, want to put something out uh, uh, that, you know, I feel like is the uh, best possible experience. And I don't want to put it out until I feel like it's the best possible experience. And that's kind of antithetical to uh you know speed to yeah. market and and being able yeah. to to run a business and, and right? yeah perfectionism it's really and and i know that a lot of uh a lot of ux designers um uh you know can kind of struggle with that uh uh you know and but i i think that it's it's definitely something that you can overcome when i when i went into business for myself i had to overcome that I had to yeah. get to the point where I realized I'm not going to make money if I don't go ahead and put this out right now. Uh, it's no longer about whether I think it is the best possible thing that I can do right now. Um, uh, you know, where I I absolutely just pour everything into it, and and I couldn't possibly have done anything better in that moment. It is the best thing that I could do with the constraints that I have when I have a family yeah. to feed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the important part. Yes. And, yeah. um, that will, that will make things real for you very quickly. So I, you know, I don't know how uh, every designer would respond to that, but I know that that perfectionism is a thing that a lot of designers, it, it, it's part of what can make them good. They have a very high bar of, of quality and they want to meet that bar and they kind of define themselves and their skill by that bar. Um, and they're not completely wrong on that, but in some ways they are wrong, uh, to say that, you know, because you, because what you shipped wasn't, um, uh, the pinnacle that you're not a great designer. No, it means y'all didn't have time to, to ship the pinnacle, man. Like it, it, <laughs> that's what it means. <laughs> yeah. It's, there was a recent study done on, um, grade schoolers on output. Right. And, and there were two groups of children and one group was told to make the best thing they could. I think it was pottery or something. And then they told the other children to just make as many as you can. Right. And the, can you guess like who did better? Oh yeah. I mean, definitely the, the one, the ones who had more at bats, man, the ones who made more, more pottery yeah. and just let it fly. Exactly. Yeah. Cause they learned, they, they did it quickly and they learned from what, what didn't work. And then they went, and they created something amazing. Um, and I've heard, you know, I started writing on Medium like a, I don't know, six or seven months ago. And the one thing everyone says is just, even if you think it's garbage, just put it out, right? Because you you have to take a chance sometimes. Um, and it, and it's, a, it's good advice. Because again, the market's going to decide if somebody sees it and they like it, they'll tell their friends and it'll grow. Um, if nobody sees it, then... Well, 10 years later, they might see it and love it. That's um, right. It's a matter of timing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I remember, you know, I'm, I'm, I also do art and I remember in high school, good friend of mine, um, uh, you know, he, he and I've been friends, uh, uh, for like 25 years now. And we were in class one day and, uh, I'm drawing something and I'm, I'm mad because I know that it's not matching the vision of, of quality that I have in my head. Uh, so I'm getting ready to, to, you know, rip it out and crumple it up and throw it away. And he stops me and he says, don't ever do that again. And, you know, I realized it, he was saying, you think this is trash. He, he said, you think this is trash, but to everybody else, this is good. So, so yeah. don't, you know, you're, you're, you need to let other people have a chance to, to decide whether or not it's good to them uh, and not always, uh, uh, think that what you're, what you're judging it to be is, is the truth. Um, and that, yeah. that had an impact on me. 
we're, we're our worst critics, right? Yeah, especially with art. Um, but yeah, I'm glad he made you not crumple that up. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was uh it was definitely a, a milestone moment. He probably doesn't even know that that moment had a, as much of an effect on me uh, as it did. Um, but I I think that that's one thing that that designers, if they have that struggle, they've got to be able to overcome that in order to be a, a, a good entrepreneur. I think the other thing is um, sometimes designers can have this. Uh, uh, this sort of negative view of, of business and um, yeah. you know, what's necessary to uh, run a business that works for your customers and works for you that rewards you well. And I think that's another thing that has to be overcome for a lot of designers that like business things aren't yucky. Um, uh, if you're providing real value, people want to compensate you for that. They want to, to uh, uh, yeah. give you value for you providing them value. And I think designers are, um, they're, they're well positioned uh, to be able to do that. As long as, you know, the things that you were mentioning, being able to ask questions and to listen. Um, a, a good UX designer is good at listening, especially ones that, that uh, do user interviews regularly or at least sit in on them. Um, they're, they're good at listening to the market and, uh, or, or they could be good at it probably better than they think. Yeah. And as long as you're doing that and you're giving people, uh, something that really solves their problem, they want to give you money. But I know, uh, you know, you start talking about business stuff with some designers and they start, they say, mm, no, I'm, I'm above that. Like, I don't, you know, I don't <laughs> have to deal with that. Have you experienced any of that? Not really. Um, but, but I, I could see it happening. Yeah, I've, I've, I've definitely experienced some of that. Um, I think that it's, it's becoming less popular. I think the startup world, as a matter of fact, the startup world made it less popular because a designer working at a startup is, is closer to the metal, the, the mm -hmm. uh, success of the business. Usually they're sacrificing something um, to go work at a, at a startup, especially if they're strapped for cash. Um, you know, you're sacrificing some compensation. So you want the business to do well because you want the payoff. Um, and right. so, you know, I, I, I feel like the startup world has brought designers a little bit closer, um, to, you know, how, how the sausage is made and, and it's made business stuff less yucky, um, uh, to designers as a whole. Cause I could say about 10 years ago, it was definitely a little more common, uh, to have designers kind of stick their nose up at, at some of the business concerns, but now I, I don't find it as much. Uh, and that is, uh, it's definitely a welcome change. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's kind of where like, um, partnership and diversity comes in. Right. So let's say you've got someone who's really into business, but they don't know anything about like creativity, right. They need someone who has the creativity who doesn't care about business and then they can share the results. Right. Right. And, and, and to, to, not demonize one another for their their uh, right. their unique perspectives that are both needed in order to make uh, uh, the ship run right in order to make the ship yeah. float. Um, and and that's I agree. I str I struggled uh, I struggled for a while with being mad at like when you know somebody who was being held responsible for business results would pull a project or, or, you know, pull the rug from under us and, and, uh, or, or want something to happen at a, at a certain pace. And yeah. I, I think that it took UX design as a practice a while to really, um, to really mature enough to be fast. I think that that was something also that the, the startup world helped along because, you know, you had to be able to produce good things faster so you had lean UX and, and things like this that came out. Um, and uh, I think that that was one of the things that I didn't understand until a certain point um, that, you know, there you have to be able to put things out uh, that may be less than perfect, um, that are, are good enough. And it's not a reflection on on your craft necessarily. And, and that's really yeah. the, the distinction that has to be made. It's not a reflection on your craft. It's what you can put out now, um, and that gives you the chance to be able to put something out later. It gives you another at bat. You can be like, you know, the the kids in the class who made a bunch of pottery, right? And and right. Uh, uh, you know, ultimately got better. It was a, a similar study done with uh, people learning photography. Um, you know, they they had some people uh, 
uh, basically, you know, focus on just making a few really good photos. And then you had, uh, uh, you know, the other group that, that, you know, they were, they were told just take as, you know, take as many photos as you can. And of course that second group, uh, they produced the, the better photography in the end because they were learning more. Yeah. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. So I, I think, um, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, you've, you've, uh, been in business multiple times for yourself. You've worked at large companies. Um, what is your advice to UX designers who are thinking about, uh, starting their own business? Just, just start. Can't like, there's not going to be a perfect day, right? If it's something you want to do, go do it. And the more you work on it, the more you realize, yeah, this is what I want to do, or no, I don't want to do it, right? And there's, but there's always not going to be a special time, right? So it's always like take action, don't wait. That's that's very good. That's very good. How how do you know when something's good enough to release? <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, um, that depends. <laughs> Uh, like as an example, I think things do get released where UX designers like, oh, this is this is not the time, right? But but they're usually at a large corporation. They're not the one in charge. They're not the stakeholder that makes that decision, right? So you, when you have a timeline and you've got a budget, if you're starting to go over budget, you need to get that thing out, right? It's like you know when a movie movie movies go over budget. Like the, they say, you've got to put this out. It's like, well, we need to edit it. No, just put it out. <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. I think at, at one point, um, I think it was Gladiator, the, the movie Gladiator. They did some preview screenings, right? Of the Ridley Scott movie. And it got panned, like before, before it actually got released officially. Uh, and, but they took the research and they, they made some new edits uh, they did some refilming, I believe, and then they put it out and it became a hit, right? So, and that's the important part of, of testing what you put out. If if you have the budget to test, you, you really should. Yeah. That's great. Uh, yeah. I, th- I'm, I think that uh, that is one thing that uh, uh, especially a seasoned UX designer is going to have experience with and um, it's going to be used to seeing people use their stuff and, and not in any way use it the way that you thought that they would use it and, and have to iterate. Right. And I mean, that those are things that any entrepreneur has to go through. Um, uh, you yeah. know, whether you're doing services or creating a product. I think the, the other important thing when you're working at a large company is the importance of just a heuristic review, right? So let's say you work on something and you're only working with the project team and they're forcing you to get it put out, right? And maybe you do a usability test, maybe you don't. But other experts within the org should look at it, right? Because they, they're going to see things that you might have missed or they're going to see things that you you told the project team, but they didn't listen to you, right? So you've got two voices now or maybe three saying the same thing. That project team might start listening. Um, and I think that's important. And for entrepreneurship, you have to give your stuff to your peers for review, right? Like, hey, Devin, give me a testimonial on this, on this, you know, book, the ebook I wrote, right? And you could read it and go, oh, this is horrible. You don't want to put this out. I can't, I can't put my name on this. I can't do this, right? So that's that's also important. Um, so as an entrepreneur or a UX professional, you should always ask for feedback on your work, right? Um, because you're going to, if you doubt yourself and you're the only, like, like with your crumpled piece of paper, right? You were, you were judging your own work. You need to put it out there and let other people judge it for you. Right. Right. So, so, uh, any UX designers in the audience, um, if you, if you think that it's good enough, you probably waited too long. <laughs> <laughs> you probably waited too long. Uh, you know, uh, if you haven't already put it out there and tested it yet, if you have and, and you think it's good enough, it's probably because you got feedback and, and, and you refined it. Um, but, but that is cool. So uh, the, the last question I'll ask um, is, you know, uh, is, is there anything uh, sort of in the business space that you're reading right now that you think uh, other people should be reading? Oh, man, there's a lot. Um, 
there's like I, I actually just got an account with uh, short form. It's uh it's like they 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 summarize books, right? So you know, Atomic Habits is on there, and Ultra Learning is a is a good one. Um, but I've been yeah, I, I don't have my library in front of me right now, but well, maybe I do. Hang on, let me let me open my my books. All right, man, um, we're getting we're getting access here. Let's see here. Uh, something I just got, but I haven't read yet. Super Minds. Um, there's something called the Nuclear Effect. Um, let me see if, if I can find something I read, so I can get. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, there's just too much. Um, one thing I'll talk talk about really quickly is um, so this concept. Have you heard of Zettelkasten? No. So so Zettelkasten basically means like slip slip notes, like a German word, and it was. Uh, Nicholas Luhmann was this a sociologist, essentially, and a professor, and he wrote like some insane amount of books, like 70 books in his lifetime. Uh, and he did everything on on note cards. So when he read a book, he would take notes, and he would create it on a note card, and then he would file it in his own system. And he's got thousands of cards. So there's, there's digital software now, um, like Obsidian, Notion, that people are using and they're calling it a digital Zettelkast. But the thing that I don't like about it is that it doesn't have that spatial memory. It doesn't give you the spatial memory, right? So like if I take this, if I take this book, Articulating Design Decisions, I leave it in my kitchen, I'll have a mental note of where it is. Um, but whenever I take notes, if it's all in one place, it's just on your computer or the cloud. You can't really find it without searching. And if you didn't tag it correctly, you're not going to be able to find it. So I really like spatial memory and I like using pen and paper to write because it it makes more of an impression on your mind, right? It's called like neural neural imprinting. Um, and you'll remember it better. So if you take notes, if you rewrite it, you're more likely to remember it. And then when you look at it again, it'll bring that memory back. Wow. Wow. So, so I'm learning a little bit about Zettelkasten. Yeah. That so uh how do you how do you spell that? <laughs> <laughs> um I think it's Z E T T L K A S T E N. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um I'll definitely look into that. Um I I I've, I've been uh going through this actually it's funny you mentioned this. I've been going through this with my my wife really cuz she's getting into bullet journaling. There oh, go. there we go. There we go. All right. He's got it on screen. Now, now I've, I've committed it to visual memory. That's usually how <laughs> I have to see. I have to see something in order to remember how to spell it. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, she, she's gotten into bullet journaling and I, I looked at the bullet journaling system and, and uh, I, I looked at it and I was like, ah, it's, it's too much. It's too much. Uh, uh, but I, I found myself wanting more and more to go back to capturing ideas in my moleskin notebook um mm -hmm. and, and you know just randomly being able to sketch things in there and and uh you know i like that it's a blank page and i can do whatever i want with it um yeah. and, and you know i've noticed that you know i can take notes i can take notes on my ipad and i do that i do that a decent amount um and, but like with either the ipad or the moleskin and uh i i run into the problem of I don't really go back and I don't really go back and look at it too much. Um, and so there's funny, funny things have occurred where I've, I've put notes in my moleskin and I'll have some idea and I'll write it down and then I'll just flip through my moleskin sometimes and I'll, I'll come across the same idea like a year earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I thought it was writing down something new and I had already written this exact same thing like a year earlier. <laughs> and so, you know, having a system, uh, to, to be able to, to index that stuff, I, I've, I still think that I, I very much enjoy the, um, I very much enjoy the act of writing something, uh, on, on paper in a notebook that does yep. have a spatial element to it. I, I remember about where in the notebook I, I wrote it, right? Like, how many pages were before it and how many pages were after? Like, I know it's generally like in the middle or to the, you know, to the, the first quarter of the notebook or something like that. Um, and, and I've, I've 
realized that that does have a different effect on on my memory um mm -hmm. uh and I treat that differently than I treat digital notes when I when I can uh, create a completely digital note, unless I'm very intentional about organizing it, which I, I tend to be depending on what it is. Um, but other things I'm not. And when I'm not intentional yeah. about it, it goes into the ether, man. It once yeah. I, once I close that note, it, it may never get opened again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I've done that with both, you know, digital, digital notes and like analog notes where maybe it's a year old. I'll look at it. I'll be like, Oh, this is really good. Who wrote this? I'm like, oh, I wrote this. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Sometimes it's not so good. But. Yeah, I, I will say I do also have those moments where I go back and look at things that I wrote and I was like, man, that was trash. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I never did anything with that. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's awesome. Joe, thank you so much for for being on the show. Where where can people find you? Um, they can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, Joe Raposa or on Twitter, I think what's my, it's Raposa underscore J, I believe. Cool. Twitter. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Or, or medium too. I'm on medium. Oh, all right. All right. You got to give me the medium link. Folks will make sure to put that uh, in the show notes. Uh, you know, I've definitely been enjoying uh, uh, Joe's writing. He's got a lot of personality to it. Uh, it's fun to read. Highly recommend you you check him out. Uh, he's got he's got some uh, insightful thoughts and and uh, generally it, it seems like you're generating buzz, you're generating discussion, which I love. It's cool. <laughs> thanks a lot, Devin, and uh, happy birthday, man. Hey, thanks. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, man. We'll have to have you back on. As always, great talking to Joe. Uh, I think the gist of this is uh, if you're a UX designer. You came hardwired with the skills to be able to solve problems for people. You should take that skill and find a problem to solve and figure out how to build a business model around it. As Uri Levine, the founder of Waze says, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. If you're a business leader uh, and you have UX designers that uh, you think it's time for them to step up and take more ownership of the business, try to mentor one of those. Also, if you're in the Atlanta area uh, on April 19th, I'm going to be speaking at CX Forums in Atlanta, um, and I'm really excited about this. I'm going to be speaking alongside some really talented uh, customer experience professionals. And uh, hey, they gave me a discount code to give to people. Uh, if you go to buy tickets, uh, put in Devin20, D-E-V-I-N 20, uh, in the coupon code uh, field, and you'll get 20% off of your tickets. I can't wait for the event. I think it's going to be a good time. It will be awesome to see you there. Um, again, folks, if you enjoyed uh, the show today, don't forget to give me a like and uh, consider subscribing. And until next time, keep out serving your competition on your relentless pursuit to become an experience leader. Catch you in the next one.